Welcome to Map Analysis for Hedgehogs. I think it's long overdue that we take a look at hybrid analysis and um, how to use it for initial malware assessment. This is the hybrid analysis website. And um, what this is, it's just a, an automated sandbox system. So you can drag and drop a file inside. It will run the file, it will and it will process the um, dynamic execution of the file and then create a report for you. So the purpose of this as a malware analyst, at least, you can use this for initial analysis. So what does it mean? Um, you will, before you even try to dive into analyzing the code of the malware or the sample you have in front of you, um, you should try to find which is the best path to look for the relevant code. So in a lot of cases, beginners and malware analysts will um, waste a lot of time by just, you know, they see, have a sample, they put it into detected easy, see it's okay, it's um, x86 um, um, assembly code, put it into IDA and then they get lost because I don't understand what the code is doing. And if this relates to you, you might want to check uh, stuff in hybrid analysis first. Um, why? Because this saves you a lot of time. You will find um, more hints to what you should actually do to find the relevant code and what this file does. Um, so here we are. Um, let's, if you are a malware hunter, if you are a malware hunter, this is also very useful. You can check the um, uh, scans that were done lately here in the quick scans and files or URLs section. And then you see all of the latest scans. Um, if you combine a low AV detection rate with a malicious threat level that has been determined by the sandbox, um, you will have a likelihood of finding yet undetected malware. So that's quite useful. Um, the malicious threat level is especially interesting because that's where you see some behavior in the sandbox. Um, usually if you have nothing here or uh, it sets no threat, it's probably because it didn't show anything, any behavior. It doesn't mean it's clean. It just means you couldn't find anything that's suspicious, which can happen as well with um, VM aware, sandbox aware malware. So um, just because something is determined by hybrid analysis is malicious or is clean, it does not mean that this is truly the case. Okay, so what can you do here? So as I said, if you check for low AV detection rate and a malicious threat level, that's probably interesting for you as a malware hunter. You can also search for stuff, like you could say keylogger. Uh, search for keylogger, maybe you're interested in seeing what people uploaded as keylogger. So that is already some stuff you could actually use because some people for some reason someone um, put in a an archive now an archive is not executable so it does not make much sense to put something in a dynamic analysis environment which is not executable so something like an archive makes not much sense because you won't get much out of it the only reason it flexes as malicious is probably because of the antivirus detection rate which is uh, 43%. So this is taken into account too. Um, yeah, but there are some other gems in here. You can download them. Like That's the interesting part. You can download those. So if you're interested in or spoiler, Phoenix Keylogger or Falcon Keylogger crack, just download from here and you can analyze it. Um, yeah, cool. So let's take a look at a specific one that was also flagged as a keylogger by the hybrid analysis sandbox. So this is the file here. It has a very low detection rate, 2% on um, virus total. Um, and it's labeled as Trojan keylogger. But the shred score they determined is 100. We can see some of the uh, um, indicators that it takes into account, which 
it thinks is uh, the reason that this is malicious, which is here at the top. And some general risk assessment where it says, okay, it um, has global Windows hooks to intercept keystrokes and to intercept mouse events. But actually, uh, if I check a sample, that's not the first thing I look at. It's like the least interesting thing for me because this is just a summary of what the sandbox thinks is risky here. But I want to determine this myself. Is this actually risky because it depends on the context? So um, this is not the first thing that is of interest for me, at least. Um, same with the indicators. Usually I skip this first and go down. Um, that's like a lot of stuff. So the first thing I really like to look at is the file details section. You have here a button to turn more details on. Um, so this, um, these are some hashes. So what are they? Um, firstly, this is the hash that is used by Hyrobit analysis to identify one sample and differentiate it from other samples that are different. So um, what does it mean? Um, if this hash is different, hybrid analysis will say it's a different sample. Why? Um, why do I know this? Because this is part of the URL. And if that URL changes, you have basically you have a different sample. Same is done by Varistoto. So Varistoto determines this based on this hash. Because this is a um, hash function, SHA-256 is a cryptographic hash function, which means it's collision resistant. So if you change one byte in the file, it will have a completely different hash. And it is very hard to find another file or create another file that has the very same um, hash value as this one. So that is the reason why this is being used for identification. Otherwise you could just craft files that are different but have the same hash, map on the same hash. And um, that would be bad for such a sandbox. So these are included, and but usually not used that much anymore. Um, these were used in the past for the same uh, reason. And they are often still mentioned in Mega Analysis reports. So that's why they are here. So you can search for them in case you read a Maver report and see uh, this is the MD5 for the sample that they use in the report. Um, SSD is quite different to the other three hash functions because SSD is a um, similarity preserving hash. And that means if you change just a few bytes in the file, this hash value will look almost the same. So maybe two characters are different if you change just a few bytes and the rest is the same. So this is for finding similar samples. And that's also why you can click on it. If you click on it, you will find samples that look um, the same. And um, okay, let's wait until this is done. Um, oh yeah, but it didn't find any. So it seems to be the only one that looks like this. Um, and then the impash, impash is actually MD5 underneath, but this MD5 value is created on the imports of the PE file, PE file imports. So <laughs> imports, uh, the idea is that files that behave the same have similar imports um, or vice versa. If, if you have the same imports that file probably behaves similar. So you can find, um, similar files if you click on this. So let's see what we find here. Oh uh, yeah, there are some more um, that are also low in the AV detection rates and considered malicious. So this might be interesting. Impesh does not make sense for every PE file. So yeah, but that's a different topic. We might come back later. Authentihash is for the certificate. Uh, so that's a part of the PE file that is considered relevant for uh, certificate validation, but this file is not um, signed. So this isn't that relevant here. Um, here it says, this is a Delphi executable. Now remember, if you were um, 
or let's say most most beginner analysts would probably put a sample into detected easy or PID, see it's uh, ball and Delphi, and then, oh no, that's hard. And then they would try to analyze it in IDA or any Delphi um, specific um, program to analyze it. And that's the case where they would get lost. They would get lost completely because you will realize so now, actually, that is not the code we want to look at here. Why? Um, the version info tells us some interesting stuff here. And we see a mention of a website, flashjester.com. Now, if you Google um, Flash Jester Juggler Engine, you will find this and it says, Juggler turns your Flash files into standalone programs for, uh, it's important for Flash development. So, or here, converts SWF files into standalone executables. So, this is actually a Flash application that has been turned, converted into an executable um, using Flash Jester. So the part that is here um, detected as Ball and Delphi um, is actually part of Flash Jester. And it's not, so it's the execution environment. It's, that's the part that will unpack the actual Flash code and uh, execute it. So what you want to look at instead in your analysis is the Flash code. Now this version info, just so you, uh, to, to put this into perspective, uh, the developer of the file and also a Maver developer can change the version information. So this is something that's completely free for the developer to, to put in. So this could be fake. And this could be something that is just to put us off track. So you have to keep this in mind because it's a hint um, what what this might be where you, sh where you could proceed looking into. So it might be a flash file actually. Um, also, when I check the version information and the icon, that's the icon that's put on the EXE file, I check, uh, does this make sense in, in the overall picture of the program? And in this case, um, when you search for flash jester, you will find that that's, um, no, that's not the icon, but uh, miniclip.com, here is miniclip.com. Let's just Google for miniclip.com. And that is their their logo. So this kind of makes sense, it's just inverted. But uh, it kind of makes sense that they would have this logo. So it seems that this was created probably by miniclip.com, browser game website, so it could be a game. And they use Flash Jester to convert it. Um, what's this here? Now this is a... Uh, Portex is my a library that I wrote. It's written in, in Scala and Java. I wrote it for my master's thesis and they put it the visualization, which is just like a side product of my master's thesis, but they put the visualization part into hybrid analysis, which is cool. Um, I also think it's very useful because here you can estimate where in the file are interesting areas and is the file probably packed. So what you can see here is it has a huge overlay. That's this blue part here. Here's the um, explanation. And this one has also in, in the middle is the entropy. The overlay is high in entropy. So this is a packed area um, where I assume the file is packed because this is some data that's so high dense in information, it, it, it's like the, the packed data and the overlay, so, okay. But then if this is a flash converter, flash to exe converter, it makes sense that it packs other files inside. It might just use this um, overlay to put inside the actual um, flash executable, for instance, and the flash code that is executed by it. So, that, you know, in the whole picture, it makes sense. Here is some more data on the uh, file sections. Not much of interest in here, except that 
okay, we see um, CoData BSS, which is typical for Delphi applications. Um, apart from that, I don't think there's much that is really interesting for me. Um, file imports, of course, um, those are the ones used by the Impesh that I explained earlier. So the Impesh makes um, stuff on this area. And if this area has almost no imports, uh, the Impesh is of no use for you. So if there's just one or two, don't bother with the Impesh, it will not help. Screenshots are obviously very interesting. Uh, in this case, because we have a graphical interface. Uh, this is called Space Fighter Rebellion. So it makes sense in you know, in context with the file name. And it says miniclip.com. So we also see the icon here. And obviously you can play the game, but uh, the sandbox did not play it. So we also only see the uh, launch screen. Um, so, but still, so is a game. Um, it still could be the case that this is just a lore and that there is some malicious code behind it. Now let's go back to the beginning. You remember this um, risk assessment here, where it says sets global windows hook to intercept keystrokes and to intercept mouse events. Now, in light of knowing that this is a game, do you think this is still a suspicious thing? Um, actually, no. <laughs> so a game needs to read keystrokes. It needs to read mouse events. Otherwise, it cannot be played. Um, so yeah, this is not really a suspicious indicator. Actually, we should just put this off the list here. Um, but still, we do not know is it malicious or not. Um, so let's let's check the next um, part. Here is a one of the most interesting parts as well. Um, that is the process um, section, and you can also click on these processes to check um, more details about them. We see here there's a space fighter rebellion.exe process. So this was the file originally started by the sandbox, and then this one started another process called space fighter exe. So that's a different process name. The process name is dependent on the file name. Uh, so it started a different file uh, to create this process. Generally, it's suspicious if you see the same one, if we see the very same file as a chip process, it's indi an indicator that uh, process injection is used. It's not the case here um, that um, the child process was started. So this one again. Uh, because that's a different one. So we don't know if process injection is used. Um, could still do process injection. It could create a copy of itself with a different name and run this. So it could be using process injection. Now, if we look at the beginning here, it says writes data to remote process. Um, to check if it does that, um, we can click on it, get the information about the API calls that have been logged. Now, what's a bummer is we only see the first 1000 calls, so we might miss data. And when it's not there, if it's not there, it doesn't mean anything. So um, I had made a process injection graphic or um, also video about typical process injection APIs that you can search for here. Uh, but yeah, if one of the first one I do is write, and we see already there's a call to write virtual memory um, in NTDRL. And well, that doesn't look much like process injection because it's only 34 bytes. It's probably just some arbitrary data. Um, not really, um, probably not. So, in the network analysis area, we don't see any requests or any network requests. Um, so this is not indicative of a keylogger. You remember that we saw this keylogger uh, label. Where does it come from, the keylogger label? It comes from virus solo. Why? Um, see this? That's where it comes from. They just checked if there's any 
good detection name probably. We see there's only six um, detections for this yeah, because we chose specifically five with a low detection rate. And that's where the keylogger stuff comes from. Um, and also from this one here. But so far, I don't see reason to assume it's a keylogger because it's a game. It needs to log your, uh, not log, but hook your key key strokes. And we have no network. So how is the attacker supposed to get the keystrokes in this case? Well, it's possible that this just did not happen because the malware only does it once a day. We don't know. Um, maybe it waits for a long time until it uploads some keystrokes. That could be possible. Um, yeah, but so far, no indicator for that. The extracted strings, these are interesting as well. Um, if I remember correctly, it even includes some in-memory strings. So you might find quite interesting stuff. You can scroll through, see if you see anything interesting. There is also a um, selection of strings that are deemed interesting by hybrid analysis. Um, just go through, see if there's something that um, looks like it could be typical for malware. Um, something that catches my eye is this shell open command. It's often um, used in combination with certain UAC bypass techniques. So um, if I, I would take note of that and specifically check in the deeper analysis of how, how this string is used, how, if this is indeed a USC bypass technique. And um, similar, we can see here similar stuff and everything just points to this gesture um, environment. So this is probably really just a dot uh, flash um, converter and nothing else uh, when it comes to the main Delphi code. Um, now, as I said, uh, this part here, um, the process, it has to drop the space fighter file somewhere to create a process of a different name. It, so what I'm questioning is, is the space fighter file copy? Or is it the same file as spacefighterrebellion.exe? And if you check down here, you see that's the spacefighter.exe. Um, and it's a different file. Why do I know that? Because the hash, the SHA-256 is a different one. If you compare this, it starts with 155FA. And ours, you see it in the URL, so it starts with one, uh, 0, C, 4, and so on. It's a different file. And this file is also deemed clean by virus total. It has only zero, uh, detection rate of zero. Um, let's check the virus total report actually. Oh, and the name is be of this file is svflsh32xe. So this is a uh, flash, flash executable. Let's check it. Yeah, that's a flash player. Um, and we see it also um, named the spacefighter.exe. Um, but yeah, that's just, that makes sense. You know, if you, you cannot assume that a computer where the game is being played has flash um, player on it. And to um, be able to execute this flash application everywhere on Windows systems, you just put inside the execution environment, which is the flash player, inside this um, whole file, additionally with the flash code. So now you know, it's pretty sure that this is a um, flash executable just, and, and you only need to check the flash code of that and not the Delphi code. This just around here is deemed malicious. For what reason? Because someone, some AV scanners think it's malicious. Um, but then the name gesture run for me just indicates it's part of this gesture um, execution environment. And while when I check virus total, roughly three is not much. And all of those um, security vendors are not really well known. So these are, well, if it was like Kaspersky or Avira or 
bit different. No, I would take it a bit more seriously, but no, not these. Um, that's likely clean. And this file at least. So, and now as a last measure, I would probably just check, okay, what, what, what do we have here as, um, you know, malicious indicators. Let's go through them a bit. Um, I will also tell you not all of them I displayed because you need to full, the full version for that. Um, so not everyone has the money to do that. Um, but let's go through them. It says it has five malicious indicators, which are probably responsible for, for this verdict and threat score. And the first one is um, Windows hook to intercept mouse events. We already know that makes sense for a game, so ignore that. Extracts a file that was identified as malicious. Well, that was the gesture run DIR where we checked virus total and it's like, nah, it's probably clean. Um, plus, if you check the first submission date, 2008, um, if this was malicious, it was scanned one day ago. I don't think uh, it takes that many years um, for malware to stay unnoticed, so no. Um, not really indicative. Um, installation persistence, computer-based training hook. Sets a callback procedure using this filter. I'm not sure what this is about. I guess I would have to Google what this actually is. Um, writes data to a remote process. We checked that and now since that you open it, you see ah, there has been actually, there have been more calls to this write um, process function, I guess. But these are all like, like only at most 52 bytes. Mm, not really. Sets global windows to intercept keystrokes. So same, it's a game. So what do you expect? Um, yeah, not really. Um, none of these are indicative of malware in this case. So a suspicious indicator, let's also go over them a bit. Um, it says here anti-reverse engineering fires, fires unusual entropy sections. Um, this is something, you know, you can compare with this picture here. It says uh, the code section has a lot of high entropy. I do not see this here actually because uh, the overlay is f way brighter than the code section is. Um, let's check the code section. The entropy is 6.4. There's a little bit of a mismatch because I calculate the entropy different from uh, from this here. Um, it seems that here, that seems very high because, you know, entropy is either based uh, on, on eight bits. So it goes from zero to eight or it is uh, from zero to 10. And it seems that here they calculate the entropy from zero to 10, whereas uh, down below it's created um, from zero to eight. So we have a small entropy here in this area. Um, they do, that's bad. They use different parsers. It's, uh, that's, uh, no, this one. That's a bit um, confusing, but uh, generally if this value is high, it means it's actually probably packed. Um, but then it's not that high. The overlay is far higher. We can see in the picture. It, unfortunately, the overlay entropy is not shown here. Okay. Anyways, it, it's not as high as it seems here. Um, environment awareness tries to evade analysis by sleeping many times. It's probably normal for, for a game to do that. I'm not sure. Um, reads the active computer game name. Yeah, okay. If it's just that, why not? Um, Sample was identified as malicious by at least one virus engine. We know that already. Reads configuration files. Now it reads its own, its own ini file. Uh, so yeah, that's the file it drops itself. It's its own settings file. Nothing suspicious here. Drops executable files. Yeah, we know that already. But then that's like the flash um, executable that needs to run the flash code. 
writes a PE file header to this. That's when it writes um, the space fighter exe, then yeah, so it's not another <laughs> indicator. It's just logical. If you drop an executable file, you have to write it. Um, yeah. Found potential IP addresses. I think that's the version number from the version information here. File version, product version. It's not an IP address. Um, reads terminal service related keys. Oh, I would have to Google those. A terminal server. Okay, RDP related. I don't know, but it did not do any network connections whatsoever. Not sure why it needs that. Um, marks files for deletion. Um, yeah, apparently this is uh, dropped in temp. Like this is common for such wrapper files that they drop the execution and settings and uh, the code uh, execution environment into the temp folder and delete it afterwards. That's what the temp folder is for. So you can just put temporary files in there. Um, nothing suspicious about that. Opens file with deletion access rights. Yes, that's the same as this one. Marks file for deletion. Then you would want to open it with deletion access rights. Entry point is an, an uncommon section. Now this just around here uh, seems to be packed with AS pack. Um, we see this here as well. There are crowdsourced Yara rules matching on AS pack and they find the section name named AS pack. When you check the sections of this one, it has an AS pack section. So that's the reason why it's probably packed. Um, and import suspicious APIs. Well, this is to deal with registry stuff, file attributes. All in all, I don't think this combination is suspicious. Um, I mean, yeah, but what you can use this for is if you want, if you did not have a flash file and did not have to analyze the flash code, but the actual assembly code in IDA, um, I would check um, specifically where those APIs are used because yeah, they are interesting if you analyze malware but it doesn't mean that the files um, are suspicious because many files need those APIs as well that are uh, clean and well, why not? Um, installs, patches, hooks, running in the running process. This might have to do with uh, the hooks um, that it places for keyboards um, and for keystrokes and mouse events. Reads information about supported languages. Well, that Probably every file does this. I'm not sure why this is suspicious. Uh, a lot of files do this. Um, and then it has some more indicators that it doesn't tell us because we don't have the full version. But yeah, but I don't think you are missing out on much if you don't see them. Um, as you can see, most of these uh, things that are deemed as um, suspicious are actually not that much of a deal here. Um, so I oh, found a URL flashchester.com. Yeah, there are more informative um, files, um, things here. Um, but I think you get the you get the idea of how to use this properly um, and what you would do next. So next thing for you is uh, Google how you analyze slash files and there you go. So to sum this up, what did we learn today? What can we conclude? Well, is our sample clean or is it malicious? Well, the likelihood that this file is clean is very high, but we do not know for sure. To know this for sure, we will have to analyze it further. Now, hybrid analysis in this case helped us to determine where we should need to look further. Um, we know already that the sample is dropping a flash player and probably executing some flash code. So that's where we should look next um, in case to be more sure about its cleanness. <laughs> um, determining if a file is clean is actually more difficult than determining if a file is malicious. Um, simply because if it's malicious, you just find a malicious code, that's it. If it's clean, when do you stop searching? 
for the malicious code that still could be there. Um, that's harder, so at some point you will have to decide if it's worth to continue or not. Um, yeah, but in this case, I would probably just analyze the flash code and then that's it. So I would declare it clean if I don't find anything suspicious in there. Um, what did we learn about hybrid analysis? Now, hybrid analysis is very useful, obviously, to save us time in the long run. You should take the time and um, use these tools that give you an overview. Um, that includes using a hex editor, using a file static file parser like PE parser, using um, tools like Detected Easy, and that includes sandbox systems. So those are the first things to check and to take notes. And a lot of malware analysis is you make assumptions and then you try to confirm these assumptions. Now, a lot of the things we find, um, oh, it's probably flash. Um, those are like probabilities. It could be, as we learned, the version info could have been faked by the malware actor, um, threat actor, and then it might have been seen like this was a flash application when it's actually not. So you need to always confirm your assumptions and uh, come up with new assumptions if they don't confirm. Um, yeah, and uh, sandbox systems in general, although they are useful, you should not take their overall result as the global truth. Um, they have wrong verdicts all the time. And um, you are the expert or the malware analyst, you as the malware analyst, you are the one who needs to interpret all of the data and the results in this sandbox report. It should not be on the sandbox system to tell you what is actually suspicious. You need to use your own knowledge and common sense to check if this is true. So I hope uh, you learned something today. If you want me to check other samples in virus, total, hybrid analysis, whatever, um, and run through them, let me know. Um, if it's interesting for a video, I will include it. So, but I don't promise anything. So no, I'm not publishing it often. So I usually choose very carefully what topics I will cover. Um, yeah, but let's uh, hope the next one will be soon and see you next time.